So, first important question. Is your party from the village of Helix? Or have they traveled here? The party or the individual characters? Uh, the party. Yeah, I mean, I think being local boys would be kind of cool, but but I'm open to whatever. Everyone's teamed up already. We're an adventuring company. Uh, do you all want to be from here? Do you want to have a mixture? Is what there... kind of a place is Helix? So let's talk about the general area first. And these are just images, so there's nothing to scale or anything. Um, so the Barrow Maze takes place. Uh, and I like to say the uh, western frontier uh, of the known world in the Duchy of Eric, which is named um, after the ancient uh, hero who settled the area, um, Eric Irongard, and his descendants are in charge of the duchy to this day. Um, Helix is situated... At the north eastern part, um, well, kind of, maybe just the north, um, of an area uh, called the uh, Barrow Moors. Um, now, this area is rife with these uh, ancient burial mounds um, called uh, the Barrow Mounds to the locals uh, which are old tombs uh, filled with you know treasure glory things that would attract of course adventuring companies um, so each summer uh, which is when uh, seasonally it's passable to be able to even explore these like dank swampy barrow mounds um many adventuring companies often come to helix um to try to find fortune and glory of their own uh during the off season so to speak some adventuring companies stick around some leave um but your characters um are in the same game as everybody else their pictures they're looking for gold for glory which is actually a really good system um is everyone from here is it a mixture what are you guys feeling well i still don't have a handle on whether elves are indigenous to this region or not so there are some areas that have some elves like uh, in the wooded uh, regions in the duchy uh, they're not common by any means, uh, but they are not as uncommon to raise much of a stink. Okay. So, Arl, who's probably semi-local, not from the village of Helix proper, but one of those small elven communities in the woods. Uh, Krenzler is from somewhere in the south. He's pretty vague about it, and he's obviously been on the road for a couple of years generally staying one or two steps ahead of people who want to kill him because they met him. Um, very uh, Kuggle the Clever sort of vibe. Most of the elves in the region are from the Thorns Wild Forest. Uh, Fantastic. But many of them have kind of been leaving another region called the Weirdwood as it's getting, well, weirder. And mm. uh, so you could be, you know, he's from either of those areas, whichever. Okay. Uh, I'll say Arl, who's one of the folks who just left the Weirdwood. And so now she's uh, said, well, that's a little too weird for me. Cool. Um, so I imagine potentially here, Ross, that your clerics of St. Yig are... Uh, there's actually a shrine of St. Yig in... <laughs> Helix, which is ran by Brother Othar. Um, and there's a couple clerics that work there already, Sela and Gamdar. Um, if you want to be locals, you could be 
from that very shrine. What do you think? Um, yeah, absolutely. That'd be fine. Cool. Uh, then Thad, what about your characters? What are you thinking? They're local boys, for sure. Oh. Born and raised in old Hearing. Yeah, huh? with old, old hearing stories of, uh, you know, stay out of those, stay out of those barrows, boys, and they know that's where the, that's where the real treasure's at. Now, if you'd like, um, we can have Zazabone related to Mazas the Magnificent. It could be, um, under his tutelage. It could be a sure. student who's running off. Uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, or not at all. No, I think that sounds good. The way you want to be, uh, ru running off or, uh, being a good boy. Well, no, let's, let's stay on the good side of the powerful wizards and, uh, Maybe okay. Sent to an errand or something. I don't know. Yeah, that's actually was kind of the back of my head. I was like, well, maybe that's why you guys are heading out. Um, cool. And then, um, Hoggis. Um, now, another thing was, uh, you can have him be from somewhere weird like Bogtown or something if you want. Oh, you those guys, those there? guys are jerks. The Bogtown guys. <laughs> All right, cool. So he's uh, he's just a half one from Helix. Um, you know, he nothing too special about him. Okay, cool. So that's like plenty of story. Local boys. Um, now, I always like to ask this too. Um, does your adventuring company have a name or a symbol or maybe not yet? Too early. I think it's too early. We have to do something first, right? We're uh -huh. just earn it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's, it's like getting your uh, call sign. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you're a pilot. Something horrible happens, and then you make a an awesome sounding name out of it, and never tell anybody how you really got it. I love that. I, that's how I always do it. Um, I, the coolest one that I ever got to experience personally was a, a game I ran, and the the party called themselves the Lucky Ghosts, and I'm not huh. I'm not gonna tell you, um, but how cool does that sound? <laughs> um, so uh, then. One other little final question here is, uh, who's the leader of the party? Who who organized this shindig? Now, um, One, Ross two, three, and I in our games tend to kind of look at charisma, and that tends to potentially be who the party leader is, but not always the case. I have a charisma of seven. August has a charisma of seventeen, so he's kind of a charming son of a bitch. Wow, wow! In another life, he was a paladin. Grabs yeah. August, uh, arrange the crew. All right. I'm Sounds okay with me. that. And then, uh, the Chronicler, the, the character who, like, in game is kind of keeping track of ledgers and taking notes and the map and stuff. Uh, who might that be? Uh, intelligence, if you're looking at stats. Yeah, that's not going to be me. <laughs> Neither uh, my guys. <laughs> Arl who can do that role, but. I don't know that how many Barrow Maze games I'm going to make in the future. So I could do it today, but it's not necessarily something I'm going to be here for every game to do. Artug is barely sentient. <laughs> <laughs> Wipe the drool off your chin, friend. <laughs> um, so another... Yeah, and that's another element of this game. Um, I tend to do it like... I'm going to do it very old school where like... If you, if you miss a session, that's fine. We can come up with a reason your character's not there or whatever. We can figure it out. People can come in and out. That's why I also encourage uh, leveraging your retainers and stuff so that you have some extra characters so that if it winds up just being two of us or potentially even one of us, uh, we're still pretty much covered, you know? Like, we can still make something happen. Um, cool. I feel good about that. Now, um, I'm down to kind of start in media res maybe the the first um day of exploration for this crew um we can go ahead and actually maybe have them at the barrymore if you guys want to do that um or if you want to start in helix itself first if you guys have some stuff you'd like to do there that's fine too um what are you guys feeling uh, well, I've got all the gear that I need, and uh, there's a tendency since Village of Hamlet to get bogged down in the village itself for several sessions, and I kind of want to cut to the chase. And Yeah, agreed. Yep. 
Yeah, I'm kind of the same of way. That last session, I spent like <laughs> an hour role playing in the village instead of. Hey, though, don't feel too bad. It was cool. It was <laughs> fun. Um, and we actually, we still, we cracked into a couple still too. So we're good. There's, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. And sometimes the village itself has fun stuff going on, you know. The uh, the, I agree. Let's get the, out there. Yeah, the village of Hamlet has, you know, the evil cultists that are secretly infiltrating and whatnot. But, you know, let's hit the barrow mounds and then we can come back and the evil cultists that are hiding in the village of Helix can ambush us for our money. Okay, cool. And so, um, we should, yeah. This is going to be a little bit of a... Uh... I'm not that familiar with Roll20, like I can kind of get along here, but... I did not know that they did a hex-based map. Hell yeah. So uh, this is actually to scale. Each one of these is going to be 50 feet. Um, we can use maybe this as the marker for the party. Um, let me... Can give you guys control of that or something, right? Yeah. Controlled by all players. So anybody can move it. Um, so kind of the way I do it, I'll give you like a little description of like this area, just to, for ambient, like always think about that in your head, is... Um, the barrel mounds are these rolling, swampy hills. It's humid, it's sticky, mosquitoes are trying to get into your armor, it smells dank, the, the, uh, the ground oozes this black water, um, the, um, you know, some places are, are worse than others. Maybe it comes up to your ankles. Um, and it's even only during the summer uh, that it's dry enough to even explore. Um, in Barrow Maze campaigns, usually um, in like the other three seasons, unless you come up with some way to continue, uh, your adventures wind up in other areas, which there are some other areas. Um, this area is like mostly what Greg provides for you, and then the other areas are meant for me to come up with some stuff. Um, I also like to kind of house rule it just for simplicity. The summers, the seasons are each 90 days, nine, 10 day weeks. Makes it very easy. It's summer number one, right? Easy. Um, you guys are expert planners, and you started adventuring on the very first day of summer. Great job. Uh, it's that you have the halfling, like, farmer's almanac, so you, like, knew. Um, but the so rolling hills, these ancient tombs um, scattered throughout. You'll find perhaps an entrance that's uh, covered in dirt and, and loam and roots and stuff. You have to dig out. Sometimes there's cover stones that have to be cracked open. Um, some have already been broken into. Um, and venturing is definitely kind of an industry in the area. <laughs> uh, the There's trees and vines and moss and mushrooms and fungus. And I kind of house rule um, that you can see um, one hex radius around you, essentially. Um, but then, like, when you discover stuff, it stays marked on the map. Um, it's, there's also mist and fog. Um, sometimes a day, it's like as close as your arms reach. Um, very spooky. It's also preternaturally quiet. Um, you, it's the, you, it's like insulated almost, like cottony. Um, you know, sounds don't travel as as like far as they should, but any sound is also very like jarring and disruptive due to the the, the silence um even those of you with uh, magical gifts from your god you feel almost insulated from their grace um and that's the the more difficult turning undead table you use for baramis um 
the very area you know has an aura of evil and, and ancient wickedness um, you know who knows what horrific things have gone on here in ancient days but lots of treasure you can get rich if you're willing to risk it that's what adventuring is all about um, yeah I guess there's heroes here and there who do it to try to vanquish evil from the land but for the most part it's really about getting rich uh so i might do music later tonight just do your own thing uh i actually really recommend this band dim d-i-m um anything of theirs is really good just to throw on in the background um does all that kind of make sense huh? are they like a dungeon synth band or like how can you type in dim it's kind of yeah they're dungeon synth Okay. Um, their most recent album's called The Holy Crag. And then uh, their, all their other albums start with the word compendium. So if you do dim compendium, you'll find them. They rule. All right, cool. Um, let me crack this open here. And we will do a little exploration. You need uh, tokens for our characters that you can load onto the map? Um, yeah, in, in Roll20, are you guys able to, like, drag tokens out and drop them on yourselves? Yep. Um, cool. Okay. And then if you do, if you just do that and pick it out, I'll, like, assign it to you or whatever. I just, I, I can drag a token off of my character sheet, but I don't know how to upload a specific icon for it when I'm oh, not the DM. Um, you could just do it, give it to me in Discord. Right. I see Ross's. I think it automatically yeah. set it up right. How did you do that, Ross? Oh, uh, if you're able to edit a character sheet in Roll20, you can just click and drag a JPEG into the bio info section. Uh, I'm sorry, in the top uh. right corner, you go to edit first. And then it oh, has an okay. avatar feature, and you can just drag an image into it. And Aha! From the journal, you can just drag them on. I call it PowerPoint with friends. I worked in, used to work in an office environment. And... Yeah, that's kind of the way to do it. It automatically links it to your sheet and stuff. There we go. Um, but we don't, we only really will need those when it's like if there's an encounter. <laughs> when it's go time. For the most part, we'll uh, be using that thingy. And then um, I have a square mat set up, too, for um, if you crack into one. Is Krenzler at work? Krenzler's a half orc? Me. He has a charisma of four. He cannot pass for human. That's awesome. I love it so much. <laughs> I love playing half orcs. Um, okay. And then maybe I'll do this. Sorry that I'm like slow and bad at roll 20. I'll get better. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't need to mark it. I know the right one. All right. So, um, that, this is the start right there. And I think if I do this, it forces you guys where I'm at, right? Or maybe if I do this. Yes. There you go. We're in the Southwest corner. Yep. And, uh, Thad, are you, like, do you have the Barrow Maze memorized, or you've played it a pretty good amount? Or... No, no, I've actually never played it. I've, I have High Fell memorized. Oh, hell yeah. And then uh, Jesse knows a little, and Ross knows a tiny bit, right? I know to fear giant scorpions. That's about the extent <laughs> of my knowledge. Cool. Now, um... You know, Greg's mean, so he wants you to yes. roll for random encounters every other round, which I might might be okay with here. We'll see. Um, cool. So the one other thing that I like to do is basically, since it's summer, I like to maybe say you have eight hours to explore and be able to get back to Helix by nightfall. Um, it takes a half day of travel from Helix to these Barrow Mounds due to the treacherous nature of the terrain um 
So, with summer daylight, we'll say maybe eight hours of exploration and still being able to get back. Um, and then... I th and then we do one... What were we doing? I think it we were doing three... You could do three hexes per ten minutes, right? Is that what it was? Yep, three hexes... Uh for one exploration and then yep. we could see one hex around us with light in the yep. mist so we'll do that away so because that matches the the uh, hex speed for the, the lowest encumbrance which is you do have some characters at that um so we'll do um each 10 minutes since you're you know having to fight your way through the the overgrowth and be careful of the swamp and yada yada yada. Um, each ten minutes you can travel ten. Or sorry, each ten minutes you can travel three hexes, um, and you can see in a one hex radius. Um, who's the party leader? Uh, August. August. So it says I I used to have a. I can't put a picture in and I don't know where to delete old pictures because I used to have a premium account and I got rid of it. Oh, that's a pain in the butt. The file management in Roll20. I don't even see where they are. Anyway, yeah, so let's proceed out. It's not important. It's just it's annoying. Sorry. Let's proceed uh, northeast. I agree. Uh, Arolhu, the elf woman, is leading a pony that's laden down with... Uh, Saddle yes. and gear. So someone did take it back in. Well, I always love that. Very old school. Um, excellent. Pack, well, pack animals are the first to be killed by Greg. I can tell you. <laughs> know, sure. I, I'm I, one I, step back from Greg's level of meanness. I don't have one to outrun back. the bear. <laughs> just the poor mule? Just, just feed it the mule. Um, cool. So, actually, if, if you all don't mind... Um, right before this move, um, I need a little fluff for my own enjoyment here. Um, you know, your characters are setting out. Um, they wanted to get started bright and early, right? So it's still pretty dim and dark. Um, you might even have, you know, it, it's maybe almost dark enough you want to have a torch out or something. But um, just give me a description of what your characters kind of look like. You know, in this moment, as they're setting out, um, doesn't have to be super descriptive. Just give me a little something. Well, it's still turn. dim, so we've we've went ahead and, and lit a torch or two, and we're, you know, people are still waking up in the morning, but we hit out before the first cock crow to get a, to get a start, and we're, uh, you know, steadfast and resolute and optimistic and unblooded. So the two clerics. Um... Are they both using the same setup as far as their weapons? Yeah. Mace and shield. Yeah. Are they are they wearing, are they wearing like tabards of Saint Yig or anything? Um, does the shield have any symbol on it? Um, the, the portraits are great. Um, anything like that? Yeah, um, I, I would say so. Oh, I can't. Oh wait, here we go. Uh, starting with will do will will do here. Um, He's a, uh, he is, um, oh, I can't bring up the, the character thing. Why is it not coming up? I'm going to have to reload it. Anyways, uh, so I might have this a little wrong. Wildu is like an ancient 26 years old. And so he's like balding and his, like, uh, his skin is, is modeled and everything. And he's, uh, he's very, um, uh, dour and uh, constantly by the book about everything, especially uh, the city life uh, that these poor heathens do not know of here um, in, the, in the, here in this frontier. And, and then Artug is, is a lot easier to describe. He's just kind of a, a really gentle imbecile, um, but is in constant it. prayer to St. Yig and uh, in piety to him. And he, he truly is... Um, uh, just everything he does uh, is uh, thankful and kind, um, but isn't a, a complete idiot. Like, you know. 
Now we're magic users. We have an elf. We've got a human. Um, are they at odds? Are they? Do they like to talk shop? Um, Arelhu is a very small elf woman. Like even for an elf, doesn't even hit five feet. Super skinny, tiny twig-like limbs. Um, that's probably why she leads a pony around because she can't carry more than the the things that like her spell book and the heavy fur lined cloak that she wears um she's uh pretty friendly and easy to get along with um so unless there's some sort of like horrible aggression or or major doctrinal difference between her and the other magic user she's always happy to talk about things arcane she enjoys talking about magic uh speculating about magic collecting magic etc uh, it's uh somewhere halfway between a hobby and an obsession for her um she's just a generally upbeat decent companion to have on the road has a good charisma score 13 i think and uh, uh and she's pretty smart not a super genius but smarter than the average um half orc say um, Krenzler is the opposite. He's an obvious half orc, five foot six, pretty heavy set, gangly, pockmarked, pustule laden face, constantly making weird snorting noises, picking at his ears or his nose or his butt, um, carrying a, a heavy backpack that's laden down with all kinds of tools, like a a shovel that's crusted with mysterious substances and uh, a rope that was obviously stolen from something like a butcher shop because it's stained with blood. Um, we hope. <laughs> and yeah, they are, uh, they are polar opposites in many ways. Um, he carries a sword quite openly um, and wears hardened leather armor. Um, you don't know if he's got actual metal when it comes to standing up to combat but he talks a big game um but is also extremely annoying to listen to anyone who talks to him for more than 10 minutes tends to want to be somewhere else and uh barring that they often secretly wish that he would just die i hope he stays alive he's great um <laughs> thad give me the rundown on zazabone well he he's a um He's a, st a sturdy farm boy who has shown aptitude in his, you know, his family of dirt farmers. They have, uh, they just want to get back to dirt farming with them, and um, they, they don't, they don't like this at all. So he's he's off to prove to, not only to himself but to his family that, you know, he can do this magic thing. And he's, um, but he's a sturdy lad. He's not a, uh, he's uh, actually he's he's not that sturdy. He's strength is six. But he's uh, he is a farm boy, and that's uh, that's his thing. Maybe, uh, maybe he slipped off, but he's hoping to get something to give to Mazas to be like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Hoggis. And, and Hoggis is a, uh, a scheming bastard that's, uh, he's in on every, uh, charming guy, but, uh, his, uh, his family of hustlers, you know, people think the halflings look like little kids, but, but he's, uh, he's got some pretty thick mutton chops and is, uh, uh, he, he's, a uh, creepy little halfling um but but it's charming as soon as you talk to him you know he's you know, charisma 17 and he uh but yeah he's his family's involved in the thieves guild and every uh every dirty trick that's going on or every every hustle or scam you know borderline right they're not they're not criminals but they're like they're like hustlers. homespun but it'll rip you off sure well <laughs> especially, especially people from out of town yeah oh yeah but, uh, he's uh Fortunately, he's doing... we're all locals right right yeah, out of towners um, beware, tourists beware. Cool, love it. Um, so let's do it this way. Um, the party leader, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and move one hex at a time. Your three hexes, and each time you stop, I'll let you know if anything is revealed. Give me just a second. I realize that I don't have a pencil, and I need. Should that. I be mapping? I actually have hex paper that I use for Greg's games. Um, if you'd like, I'll basically when, you know, we discover stuff, I'll, uh, mark it on here and it'll stay marked, but, um. Well, it'll stay on there, but yeah, this stuff's great. You can get it from Black Blade, Black Blade Publishing. It's in these giant sheets. 
But I actually oh. have filled I filled one up in the playtest of uh, Freebooting Caverns of Achia. Oh yeah, uh, so I may run that down the road, but I think when Dwero Deep comes out, I'm gonna have to run that instead. Okay. That so, reminds uh, me, I'm gonna need some playtesters uh, later this year for some OSR stuff if folks are up cool. for it. I love that. If you want to playtest the new edition of Arduin. Um. So, the party's traveled um, carefully, ten minutes. Um, on their initial journey here. Um, so it's not Arduin Eternal? No, Arduin Bloody Arduin. Cool. And then, uh, yeah, feel free to go ahead and make your next 10 minutes of movement. You guys have... So what if we... Uh, what has the terrain been like? You said it's still swampy and, and, and nasty. Yeah, the, the terrain will be consistently rolling, swampy... Um, Filled with ferns and trees close together, um, they kind of have to fight through with clearings here and there, vines hanging down, thick mist that only lets you see the one hex, and your nose is filled with like cold, misty, dank, rotting smell. Um, how big are these hexes? Fifty feet. Oh, okay. Um, so we can still see town. I mean, we've only gone 150 feet. Uh, no, so you're a half a day travel from Helix. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, unless you guys have a strong feeling, we'll just continue pushing northeast. Krenzel says, the only strong feeling I have is this is like walking through shit, except it doesn't smell as bad. So I'm going to move you back one here, because when you're here, you see something. Wildu holds his holy symbol up to his head every time Krenzler speaks. It's giving him a <laughs> cramp in his arm. <laughs> so I think probably the best bet is maybe for me to do this. We'll try it out. Wait a sec. Is that the magic number? See a C. I see a giant C. Da, da, da. So that'll be a covered mound or a mound. Um, essentially, you see a clearing in the trees with a large, low, sloping hill, um, and you can see the rectangular outline buried beneath earth and loam and moss and roots um what you know to be an entrance to one of these mounds now the way the cover mound works is that um it will take 3d4 plus 4 hours of digging to get to the um, entrance. Then you have to break open the cover stone. Every two player characters or hirelings that you devote to the task will reduce the time that you need by an hour. However, the minimum time required is two hours to dig out. Hmm. Do we have Your a decision whether or not to hit this right now, but that's the mechanic that we use to um, deal with that. I believe at least one person did buy a shovel or a spade or what have you. Will that speed up? I mean, I guess what we do is we set up a defensive perimeter and let one guy do or we take turns digging, right? Your choice. Um, a lot of Barrow Maze is kind of these logistical quandaries. And to kind of put it in perspective, just on the surface of the Barrow Mounds, there are like 70 possible locations before you even touch the Barrow Maze itself. So there's plenty of stuff to check out. Um, for instance, in the face-to-face -face campaign, their party 
um, encountered a covered mound and was like, eh, it's not worth it, and kept going. So uh, mostly I just want to make it clear, it's not one of those modules where you have to feel like if you encounter something, you have to mess with it. There's so much stuff in here, it's crazy. Sure, it's a sandbox. What do you guys think? Do you want to... My thoughts are we, you know, this is close to town, or it's close to, you know... Why keep going? We came here for treasure. There could be treasure here. What That's do you guys true. think? We have enough of us, says Arahu, that we could easily uh, dig up the mound while a few people are keeping watch, perhaps switch shifts from time to time as needed. Uh, it might take us a good part of the morning, but at least the sun will finally come up, even if we can't see it through this mist. All right. I think we're going to do it. We're going to make a make a, a try. Love we'll, it. Uh, we'll start off having one guy dig, and the rest of us will set up a semicircle perimeter around him. I guess we'll search the area real quick, do a quick you know, 360 reconnaissance of the of that hex and make sure there's nobody hiding, and then we can set up our shop. Set up now, remember the DM said it's faster if we have multiple people digging at once. Um, we'll, have two or th two, we'll have half the guys digging and half the people on guard. Each That's... two people that pitch in will reduce the time by one hour and I'll be rolling we'll go ahead and do this um, it's 3d4 plus four hours to dig so we'll roll that uh, we might not even finish it if it takes all day like that it's going to take more than the eight hours of light we have so yes um, and let, we'll say uh, is um God, I'm so bad with names. I'm sorry. Is it RL who? RL who? Yeah. Um, her. She's the most intelligent character, right? Probably. She's got a 14. I don't know what the other magic user has. Um. Zazabone. Who's yeah. the smartest pantsiest? Um, oh, I think Zaz, Zaz has 13. So yeah, the elf. So we'll say the elf. The elf is like the intellectual consultant here. <laughs> um, she will say that she can estimate roughly the time it'll take and she can tell eh, this would probably take um, if you if you added two extra people you could complete this by um, when you would need to leave to reach Helix you know at dark right. um, and you know, she, I guess, shares that with the party. Right. Is is staying in the Barrows totally like suicide? What is? What have we heard about that? It is extremely dangerous. It's known to be a, a you know, a death sentence unless you're some sort of <laughs> legendary hero. Sure. All right. Yeah, that's, that's what else. I figured. So we can either start digging, return to Helix, come back and explore it tomorrow, or look for some place else to explore. But she does, of course, mark it on your map. Yes. And always you could hire a bunch of people to dig. Who knows? Mm, that might be a more prudent... We don't have any gold. I mean, everyone spent their... blew their load. What do you guys think? I mean, I'm, uh, I'm... I actually kept some gold. Earl who rolled really well for starting cash. Um, and if we want to just go back to town and then hire some diggers for the expedition we can probably afford a couple of folks at least all right let's do that let's go let's go back right now go get some diggers and come back tomorrow do this as quickly as turn around before right. the party finds it yeah i mean we should be able to hire diggers for even i got a couple gold pieces left i mean these are like laborers right i mean they're pretty cheap for hiring should be a silver piece a day or something yeah there's actually i can probably pull it up here um, I think I did this math wrong. Let me fix this. Because they would essentially be peasants. Well, those guys are like professional diggers. <laughs> pro, pro excavators. The human tractors, right? Uh, yeah, you can hire a commoner to work for you for one piece of gold per month. <laughs> Do we have to pay hazard pay because we're going to the barrel mounds? Um, so, well, so I'll metagame a little bit for you guys, okay? Um, if you travel back to Helix, 
Um, well, first you'll you know you'll go to the second day of summer, which is cool, or whatever. Um, it, at Helix, if we want, we can do the full like you can. Exp well, you're from the place, so you already kind of know stuff. Um, I guess what I'm saying is like we could just do it quick and dirty, where we're like, all right, advance it a day, and then you have them, or we kind of role play it out. It sounds like you guys kind of just want to uh, hand wave it. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I mean, let's get to the meat and potatoes here. I mean, this we'll yeah. play peasant hire we'll simulator. Say, I am eager to roll initiative, get killed, and make a new character. So we'll say that you're... Um, well, we can say... I mean, I'm down to metagame it a little and say that, you know, being from the we area wanna... and, and knowing what you're getting into, maybe you hired him already. Right? Okay, then Arel, who is sort of the intellectual consultant, is like, I'll pony up some money to bring local laborers to, since we're going to expect that we have to I'll, dig up I'll some of these say things. due to the danger it's going to be five pieces of gold per month per fantastic uh, Arel who is going to hire two of them okay now do me a favor uh, yep. just kind of keep track of the fact that you've hired two we can like name <laughs> them or something later um, sure. I always like to do, you know they could turn into something cool you never know um, but for now um You've got two additional diggers, unless someone else would like to hire some as well. Yeah, I'll blow my last two gold on. Well, it's going to be five per digger per month because uh, they want hazard pay. They won't pro. I mean, I don't need these guys for a month. I need them to dig one mound, right? Yeah, they want a month in advance to go to the Barrow Mounds. Wow. Well, I guess at least I can donate two gold to the cause. <laughs> That's all I got left. Uh, I um, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, Will do. Uh, he he has actually quite a bit of gold. He's pretty pretty fortunate. Uh, so I can get two. That's ten. That brings him down to thirteen. Okay. So that'll give us four diggers, which will improve oh, the dig good. speed by two hours. Four diggers. Um. Uh, so four with... extra targets. So with those guys, um, that gets you down to. With that'd be the a full day, um, and then by the next day it would be open to actually. Um, then we got to break open the the cover or move it somehow. Yeah, now that doesn't take nearly as long. Um, okay. There's a mechanic for that as well. Um, so that's what you want to do. Go ahead and dig it out because there is some random encounter action for that. Now, um, Greg's pretty mean. So if we did every other turn, like as ridden in Barrow Maze, mm -hmm. then that's going to be per hour, three rolls. That'd right. be like 24 rolls. Right? For random encounters, yeah. yeah we're going to so, get interrupted a few times. Yeah, so um, I'm of a mind, maybe I'll do one roll for the day, just because it's our first session here. Um, so we don't get too bogged down with it. All right, so there's a chance, but... Um, so miraculously, perhaps due to this being kind of the edge of the Barrow Mounds and, you know, the somewhat, uh, more traveled area with the adventuring parties, maybe a lot of people walked past this and didn't even notice. Um, you could dig into it. Um, but miraculously, um... There's no adverse encounters your first day of digging here. Um, I imagine all the characters are on like high patrol, like extreme nervous alert, while these four commoners just kind of methodically dig and dig and scrape away. Uh, maybe RL who is trying to help, like trying to keep them quiet, like we don't want to, you know. You know, be careful. Um, uh, but toward the end of the day, as the sun is beginning to set, and you know that you should set out back to Helix to have a chance to make it back to the village in time by night, by dark. Um, they finally, you know, gradually unveil this. Eh, probably like 15 foot 
uh, by 15 foot square um, cover stone, which is sealing the Sparrow Mound. Um, like a black kind of basaltic stone. Looks like you're going to have to break into it with the spike. And in fact, the way the mechanic works is um, anyone can do it. You need an iron spike and a sledgehammer. Sledgehammers are five gold. Um, it takes two turns to crack a cover stone, so 20 minutes. It makes noise, and you make a random encounter roll due to the noise. Um, but that'll have to wait for the next day. Um, so you travel back. It'll be the second day of summer when you return. We'll kind of hand wave this for now, but I'm always open to go very deep on role playing and stuff and exploration and in town stuff as well. There's plenty of that as well. Um, uh, where are you staying? Are you staying at the Brazen Strumpet, the tavern in Helix? I don't think that Will do or Artug would ever be. They stay at the go. shrine. Yeah, they yeah. would stay at the shrine. <laughs> Stay at the Shrine of Yig. Uh, Arl, who actually asks Hogus, what place do you recommend for lodgings locally? Well, yeah, so the elf is from the woods, so she may not know much about Helix. She doesn't know anything about Helix. Yeah. Krenzler looks for a convenient ditch by the side of the road. I love that. Um, Brazen oh. Strumpet is uh, the tavern here. No, oh. I mean, we'll go for We'll stay there, you know. Cool. Uh, okay. Put it on my tab, right? We'll... We'll pay later if it'll let us. Nah, they won't let you. But you guys have money. Yeah. Uh, part of my old school uh, dungeon mastering is I rip the player characters off at every possible opportunity. Uh -huh. um, in the face-to-face -face game, in this moment, they wound up all in one room together <laughs> and paying a premium for it. Um, wow. But we kind of role-played that out. So. Uh, in this case... Uh, you can either pay a silver, three silver, or five silver for an in stay for the night. Um, we'll say since it's uh, the start of the season, it'll probably be busy. Hmm. So it's going to be five silver per person for the night, regardless. Okay. So go ahead and arrange however you pay for that. We won't go in depth to the role playing on it as what's happened. Okay. Arel, who pays uh, for some space for herself, looks a little surprised at the uh, extreme pricing, but then looks around the busy room full of Delvers hoping to get rich and is like, ah, yes, <laughs> inflation. Um, August, same thing, five silver rent. And anyone else, you know, all the, each character, five silver. Um, cool. And so. And I will, I'll, I'll mention this as well. Like I always encourage my players to, to think of our campaigns like a TV show. And this is the, the pilot episode. So these are quick cuts, right? Mm -hmm. First cut, you guys are setting out. Second cut, you notice the mound. Third cut, your diggers are digging. Fourth cut, you're back. You're kind of pissed you're paying. Fifth cut, we're back. And uh, we're looking at that stone. Um, who... Is cracking in uh, on this beautiful, dank, dark second morning of summer. Cracking in what? Uh, into the cover stone. So there's a. Uh, oh, the... oh, I'm sorry. I got it. I'm sorry. I it's like it's a half hour from Helix to the mounds, right? Uh, it's a half day travel. Half day. Oh, yeah. oh, so actually, we spent half a day getting to the mounds. Dug for four hours, sunset. We have to get the hell out of there because it's nighttime. Four hours to get back to Helix by midnight. Well, I try to. Well, I try to be Oof. nice, and so I say it's summer. There's lots of daylight, and so okay. basically, I give you eight hours per day to be able to make it back and get a few hours of rest. So. Okay. Oh, that. So eight hours, not counting the travel time there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Our My mistake, I thought it was, we have eight hours during the day, and it's half a day to get there and half a day to get back. <laughs> Yikes. Now, I, 
I might cut it to six, but for now we'll keep it at eight. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. But who's actually swinging the hammer, cracking into the stone here? Uh, who's got the hammers? Of course. <laughs> Ah, you're making them do it. You're well, damn we, right. That's what we hired for. them for. It. We paid them a premium in advance. Yeah, they Love got it. money. Up, they got a month's wages up front. And they've worked it one day. So they, we'll say they work together. It doesn't make it faster, but cool lore. Um, Prenzler know, has a bunch of spikes, so tang, he provides one of the spikes. And then... tang, tang. These sounds are, you know, it's like kind of jarring, like making you bite your teeth a little bit. You're like, ah, oh, shit. Like I. Uh, like your your the the hairs on the back of your necks are standing up because like you're making so much noise. It's so eerily quiet. You're gonna draw everything. Um, but miraculously, um, after some time, twenty minutes passes. Let me mark this one. Um, and your laborers have cracked the cover stone onto your party's very first mound that they're exploring. Um, so, you see a large, you know, roughly 12 by 12 black yawning entrance into the interior of this mound, and you see some stairs leading down into it. Um, Who's looking? Give me kind of a rough idea of how you're arranged and, and how what the light action is going on. I believe elves have infravision, so so do half orcs. So Krenzler's uh, sort yeah. of peering so if, down. So, yeah, anyone if you look with infravision, I'll tell you what you see. So Krenzler immediately is like for the last hour, every single time they swing that hammer at the spike. He gives some sort of complaint. Oh, I need to put your shoulder into it. Oh, your stance is wrong. Oh, you missed that one. <laughs> Good thing that wasn't your thumb. I love uh, it. And then he immediately, as soon as the thing cracks and falls, he scrambles onto his hands and knees and scrabbles over to try and peer into the darkness. Arelhu, meanwhile, takes a small lantern off of her uh, satchel, fills it with lamp oil, and starts working flint and steel to light it. Love it. And uh, it took about 20 minutes to crack in. Uh, how are the other folks arranged, Thad and Russ? Um, I would say that Artug, uh, he just helps, like, even though, like, along with the, um, the diggers that were hired, the whole time he chants. Um, it's all, actually the only thing he, like, you ever see, hear him say is, like, he's like, Saint Yig with me, Saint Yig comforts, Saint Yig guides. And like he just says that over and over and over again. But he he sees them digging, he digs, and uh, he's like smiling. And uh, he would probably be with the diggers. Will do not so much. Well, my guys and, are whispered uh, and arranged. Yeah. He's a halfling, so they're in the, they're bringing up the rear. Or as far as entering, we can bring up the front if you want. We've got shields and maces. Well, uh, first I'll describe what the infravision people that are peeking in see. And they see um, the stairways lead down. So each of these, uh, or this barrow and, and many of these barrows, are usually about 30 by 30 on the interior. Um, it's kind of a roughly circular interior with eh, maybe like a 12-foot ceiling. And um, the interiors of these tend to be like... Uh, crumbled stone, soil, roots growing through, you know, this fungus, mushrooms, the occasional, uh, maybe a little bit of bioluminescent, you know, here and there. But, um, and in this case, in this particular one, at the, uh, you know, at the base in the center, or the base of the stairs in the center of the chamber, uh, it appears to be a crypt with four um stone sarcophagi so ancient and crumbled they're kind of just the oblong shape um, of a person four of them lying side by side with maybe a couple feet in between each uh, but no one has entered yet that's just what the infravision people can see as they peer inside mm -hmm. and 
I assume they probably told the party. I'm not yeah. sure. Krenzler's like, I see some shapes. They're uh, like big and round and kind of crumbly like a bad turd. Uh, or who finally gets the lantern lit and then holds it up and angles it to try and shine some light down the staircase. Um, and that, yeah, that's, you see, uh, essentially four ancient stone sarcophagi, um, laying in the center of this 30 by 30 chamber with, uh, you know, moss and fungus and, uh, debris on the floor. Let's, let's look for any alcoves or chests or before we start cracking open sarcophaguses, I think we should need to be, you know, light a torch and search the area. Well, we've got the lantern. Let's head down the stairs, says Arelhu. Yeah, do it. Uh, so Krenzler draws his sword, chink, in anticipation of trouble, and then starts creeping slowly down the stairs. Uh, and then um, Arelhu gestures for the clerics to follow him. Now, some of these barrows are theater of the mindy, in which it's kind of just one chamber. Some of these have their own individual maps. Um, this is kind of the one, uh, one of the one chamber types. Now, um, you mentioned that you go down the stairs into the, um, the tomb. Now, um, does your party have kind of a set protocol where they always poke with the 10 foot pole as they go into these places or, or there's a thief who does something or anything like that that you want to go ahead and set? Uh, Krenzler's a thief, among other things. Um, he doesn't have a 10 foot pole. He tends to keep sword in hand because he's always expecting violence at any moment. Um, but uh, his typical protocol is search for traps when you open a new portal halfway down any staircase at the bottom of a staircase before opening any sort of other doorway or sarcophagus chest what have you cool so it sounds like he's gonna search for traps right yes um... and, uh, you roll because I don't know if he succeeded or not and his yep. find traps is 19 perfect that's what I was about to ask Thank you for having that on deck for me. You said 19? That's correct. Okay. So, to his knowledge, there do not appear to be any trap mechanisms here. So he doesn't say anything to the group. He just, like, gives this thing a case and then starts moving down the stairs, expecting them to just follow him with the fact that he's going down the stairs being the sign that it's okay. Um, okay now, and that, now, that prompts what... Arelhu to sort of sigh and then gesture for the clerics to follow. Here's what's going to be fun. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I have to roll something. One second. Okay. So, um, as... Is it Krenzler or Kresler? Krenzler. There's an N Krenzler. in the middle. Cool. As Krenzler's descending, fortunately he spots... Um, falling right before him from the ceiling, and he kind of does a quick back step, and you know, due to his um, low charisma nature, just kind of rudely knocks everybody backward up the steps. Um, but he does that because he notices giant centipedes um, are beginning to fall from the interior ceiling of this chamber. Um, uh, I think we're going to roll some initiative. Now, I'm probably, we'll probably theater of the mind this a little bit. Um, since they're just buds. Um, but they are pretty dangerous boys. I'm just, uh, pulling up their entry here in my book one second. I wonder if it's under G. Don't they usually put giant animals as, like, centipede comma giant? That's what I was thinking. Um, I mean, I have a stat block for it, but they have, like, a... Hmm. 
Here, let me check in here. If I was good at this, I would have like had a little post it or something. There it is. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, I got it. Um. So let's roll initiative, shall we? Are we doing so, party initiative or individual initiative? I like to do party. Okay. So we'll do that. Leader, roll a die for us. Who's the party leader? That's me. Uh, Hogus. Oh, I, I rolled a six. Are we? Sorry, I should have rolled on that. Yeah, go ahead and roll it in the chat real quick. Perhaps he'll get a six again. Haha, <laughs> one. <laughs> sorry. Um. So, so that's their initiative. So the the centipedes, there's no surprise, but they're gonna get to go first. And I think Krenzler is the only person I can imagine would be eligible for a potential snacking on. He is in uh, front. These things are probably poisonous. The, yeah, now that's that old school logic coming into effect. Uh -huh. <laughs> Alright, I was sitting here as you guys were cracking into this one. I was like, well, someone might die immediately. Um, okay. That's how we roll. Have, have faith in St. Yig. He's, he, uh, he can see us through even this. Oh, they're good little nibblers. <laughs> oh my gosh. Good, What's good, the. Good for who? Krenzler is 68. Armor class eight, okay. Yeah, like leather it. armor. Multi class well. thief. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm pulling up the combat table here just so I don't remember anything. Well, mostly because I would hate to. I hate it when I'm like, oh yeah, it's this, and then it's not, and I feel bad, so. Um, so AC8, and these guys are little babies. Um, unfortunately, yes, they do get a little bite of you. Um, they don't do any damage when they bite you, but, uh, <laughs> they poison you? that means that I have oh, to roll. Oh, actually, these are the ninny ones. Never mind. I'm not, I'm not as worried anymore. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, you know, as this happens and Krinsler bounces back and, and pushes everyone back, um, one of these centipedes, um, lands um, kind of across like his chest and neck and he feels it sink its little venomous fangs um, just a, a little like sharp ouchy uh, but then numb which of course he's like oh shit um, and then it you know he flings it off um, so there are he can see six of these things um, they are um, about a foot long each um, crawling around on the floor of this chamber, um, you know, they're, I'll say they're like black, shiny carapace, you know, you can, it, with the lantern light reflecting mm -hmm. off of it. Um, go ahead and make a saving throw versus poison for me, please. Right, row. And remember, it's old school, right? So uh, you're off to a throw. great start. I so fail. They so fail it. Okay. So go ahead and make a note for me for Krenzler. That mm -hmm. he is sick for 10 days. No, oh, no. And for those 10 days, he's only going to move at 50% of his normal movement. 
no okay. other physical activity is possible. Oh. Okay. Well, we got some guys to pack them back into town if they haven't run off. But well, he can move slowly, and right. uh, I'll say something. You know, he could hold light and stuff like that. Um, he could do non-physical activity, but he couldn't fight or dig or you know things like that. So he feels this um, numbing coldness and lethargy spread throughout his um, his body, his limbs, um, um, and he kind of stumbles back. Um, what do you guys do um, on your turn here? Are you gonna try to just get away from these things or fight them or what? Well, Krenzler can't fight anymore because he's poisoned. So he, like, collapses to his knees. Uh, uh, makes horrible sounds. And then just starts pushing, like, crawling his way back up the stairs, trying to get between the two clerics that are behind him to get away. Yeah, our, our tug, like, rushes forward to try to fend off this thing long enough for, to be able to, to do that. Will um, probably tries to help drag him out. Cool. Yeah, and Zazabone's going to cast, and, and uh, Hoggis is going to try to shoot him with his bow. Sweet. So, um, and yeah, we'll keep this theater of the mindy, because it's just some buggies here. But um, I'm going to step by step it here. The And this is a kind of a thing, too, like early sessions, we will kind of step by step it and then as time goes on we'll have like our standard procedures warning and stuff um so really if i did it totally by the book you guys would declare before initiative right but we'll worry about that as time goes on um so missile is anyone going to try to do missile attacks first yes hoggis is going to shoot his bow he's plus one to hit okay so um go ahead and roll that 14 Okay. Um, so, and I don't mind just telling you their armor class. It's nine. It's the worst okay. it could be. So he hits. Excellent. And then let me know um, how many... Six points of damage. Excellent. So that's enough to destroy one of the centipedes. What weapon is he fighting with? He's fighting with a short bow. Awesome. Go ahead and uh, describe that kill. He takes one of them out immediately. Sure. Yeah. There's many uh, after you know many many hours practicing at the uh, at the village butts. It's finally paid off, and he uh, he uh, sights down the the arrow and draws it back with all of his halfling might and skewers the uh, skewers him right in the head. I love it. Uh, it it kind of. Um... You hear a little, first off, just a little bit of immersion. The uh, commoners are like hiding behind trees. In fact, one of them has climbed a couple branches up. Um, the arrow strikes the centipede uh, in, in its head, just like you described. And it, it kind of goes like, and um, the, the foot long, you know, little mandibles and, and little legs all, it curls up. Um, Excellent. Now, uh, next phase is spells. Um, so, is it clear to Will do that uh, Krenzler was bitten and is, is hurt? Um, is Will do? What's his intelligence? Uh, really bad. <laughs> Pretty dumb. Uh, uh, they're really he, both of them are so stupid. He's got a six intelligence. He's clearly hurt but i don't know if he'd be smart enough to put two and two together that he might be poisoned oh well if he's hurt i can't do anything about poison anyway uh okay. he casts uh, cure light wounds and he says a prayer over Grinsler. i did not take any hit point damage just poison oh i didn't know if it was a different thing but if he's dumb he might he cast it anyway, anyway. <laughs> yeah yeah that happens <laughs> um now, you know what? I'm kind of curious. I'm going to double check something. I don't think it's the case. I think it's specific and it says cure light literally is like only HP, but it or might paralysis, mention. Right? Yeah, it might mention. So I'm going to double check. Um, 
Just because I want to give you that benefit if it's a thing. It does cure paralysis, yeah. Um, but it doesn't mention anything about poison. So, um, it, you do cast it successfully. Um, <laughs> what is it? Can it? What is it like? Uh, how do you invoke Saint Yig? Um, he holds up uh, the holy symbol of Saint Yig, and and uh, it's a touch he's... spell, by the way. He uh, he he grabs hold of Krenzler and he's pulling him back, and he, he's like. I, I have to perform the rites over you. I, uh, I, uh, I bless I'm you, you dirty right. heathen. You, I'm not you are dying, you idiot. No, yes, no, you're dying. I can tell. It's obvious. <laughs> the Krenzler just blah, vomits on his boots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, blessed Yig, he, this dirty heathen, that is full of sin and not long for this world. At least look on him with pity. Then it starts performing like last rites on him. <laughs> Your spirit does feel um, some sort of touch, like a, a glimmer of light in this darkness for a brief oh, moment. Oh, that's a bad touch. <laughs> the bad touch of Saint Yig. <laughs> um, cool. And then uh, I think the magic users had maybe some action in the spell phase here. What do you got, Zaz? We have light, so I will try to put it right in their. Uh... Right in their face. Ooh. Okay. Um. So you're in trying to, I guess, blind the. Um. Uh, because you said yeah. you can you can target an opponent's eyes, and if they fail a save, they're blinded for twelve turns. So, cool. Um. So you're you're kind of flash banging my uh, giant centipedes, eh? Um. Would you mind yes. describing for us kind of how that looks? Yeah, so the uh, orb of light emanates from Zazabone's hand, and he, you know, his eyes roll back in his head, and he's speaking the black tongue of, of wizardry and the arcane, and and then it did, you know, in a in a flash, it zips out of his hand, and then there's this super bright light right in the eyes, the eyes or the face of the the head, the head of the centipede. I love it. Uh, that's a actually really um, smart use of that too. I like that. Um. All right, I want to totally do this by the book, so I apologize. Um, so I want to make sure I give this thing the correct saving throw. That'll take me just a second. I'm looking... So these are for... So imagine the saving throws for your monsters are going to be in the referee book, and I'm sure it'll be by hit dice. I need to get a digital copy of this shit. <laughs> but like I also what? like Lord? Yeah, like the like a really good like hyperlinked one or something, but I actually like um I like I the probably book. Find it. I like using the book though, you know, it feels good. Um alright, here we go. Ooh. Um Sorry, that rolled off the table there. Um, so, like, they got a 16 on their save, but I don't think that's enough. No, they failed it. Um, cool. So your flashbang goes off, and um, you you can tell that these um, centipedes, these foot-long, disgusting bugs, are now 
Uh, you, they're gonna like crawl aimlessly trying to find y'all, but they're not gonna be able to make their way out of the chamber. Finish him. Excellent. Let's save. Uh, let's uh, let's take extra care when we're killing them to preserve their heads, so we can get the venom from their mandibles to coat our weapons, or potentially sell it back in town. Ah, uh, old school smarts too. If uh, you know how to handle poison, then sure. <clears throat> Krenzler yeah, I mean, is just trying to make his way up the the staircase, and Aurel, who is staying back and, and waiting sure, for the cleric. Sure. So to... uh, Hoggis isn't going to be bashful. He takes out his uh, hatchet and dispatches the the remaining centipede, and then he will uh, lop off both of their heads and place them in separate uh, burlap sacks for taking back to town. There were six of them total, right? Yeah, and I'm okay to hand wave that. They're blind for 12 turns, so that is ample time. Uh, okay. They they would be essentially helpless at that point. Um, and there are six of them, um, but, uh, my, my fee is you have to describe a quest scene of how they're dispatching these creatures. I want to know what each character is doing during this uh, scene. It probably will take your characters, uh, maybe I'll say it takes them 20 minutes, um, to carefully do it. Um... And so I'll make a note of that. You've been exploring for 40 minutes today so far. It took 20 minutes to crack it open. And then uh, it takes about 20 minutes for this encounter. But describe it for me. I mean, uh, Artug, uh, he, he ran forward as all this was happening. So he's got his mace. And as it lights up, he, of course, this was the... Uh, the blessing and will of Saint Yig, and so he's just he's chanting and and creepily smiling as this Iker splashes him in the face, and he's like, Saint Yig needs me, and I need Saint Yig, and he's just like going from thing to thing, crunching its skull and making it screech like a insect splashing. And in your mind's eye, these are foot long centipedes, so. Hold your hands in front of you. That mm -hmm. fucking big. Mm -hmm. Gross. Carl, um, who just kind of winces and stays back to let them do the bloody work while Krenzler crawls back to the top of the stairs, crawls over to like the pile of, of supplies next to the, the diggers who stayed in the, the tree line up top, and then he just sort of curls into a ball and <laughs> silently like groans from time to time. He's not a fan. <laughs> He's sick. He's going to be sick for a while. So yep. Zazabone is using his dagger to, to dispatch them with a you know swift blow to the back of the, the base of the, the spine or back of the head and then taking extra care to, to stay away from the mandibles and uh, where, the, where the... Do they have mandibles? Yeah, yeah. Pretty sure the so Ikor covered like, mandibles. Uh, all business. Yeah, Hoggis and Zazabone are, you know, they, they got these bags and they want to get as many heads as they can to, uh, wherever the so stinger Zazabone's is, I don't... Zazabone's even pitching it. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is pretty, I mean, he knows about, uh, material what's spell the, components. Uh, what's the, uh, dispatching with? He has a dagger. Okay, cool. And this is, like, a solid, this isn't, like, some, like, little bullshit pocket knife. This is, like, a solid, like, foot and a half long medieval dagger. It's longer. The blade's longer than a ruler, right? I love this party. They're like pro ass adventurers already. <laughs> Maybe you'll call yourselves the centipedes. Um, the human cool. centipede. Oh no! You know I'm a huge horror buff, uh, and I've actually never even watched that. Um, I need to. Um, cool. Well, that's a fun encounter. Um, there's. Uh, some of the bugs in this are very deadly, but I, now I remember uh, that's kind of Greg throwing you a little bow. Like. So this is a paralyzing, hypothetically we may be able to get a paralyzing, or someone in town to get a paralyzing poison from these guys. Um, so, act, so they don't paralyze, they give you a sickness that lasts for, what did I say, 10 days? 10 days. 10 days where you can only move at half speed and take no that's physical what I action. Meant by, that's what I meant by so, paralyzed. They, Krenzler's they basically you... out. Krenzler it can't you, adventure uh, for 10 days. Well, he can't do physical activity. So he could, but, and he's also very slow. So, yeah. Um, so, and again, you know, old school game. Um, 
the party, you know, obviously we're not going to decide this right now, but the party might elect to use that 10 days to do something. Um, uh, you might just go out with one of your characters if you go back. Uh -huh. um, you know, hire yep. somebody to replace. You know, there's a lot of options. So. Are yeah, we yeah. doing a one for one, like is one real time day, to, or is are we hand waving, or how's that going to work? How's the no, passage keep, of time? I'll, I'll keep track of time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it depends. Like you know, we could hand wave weeks or months at a time. We could do day by day. Like it, it just depends on kind of what's going on, you know. So Greg was doing a one for, in the cap. The, um, <laughs> sorry, the Thracia campaign. He was doing a one for one, and my guy uh, burned down. The, he got drunk and burned down the Un on a carousing roll. And, like you uh, do. I was, I was thrown in jail for three months, and I couldn't play that character for three real time months. <laughs> the, not like that. <laughs> I don't think that's that's pretty harsh. And he got really mad because I said, "All right, uh, uh, see you later." So I, had, I I had this I had this dog named Mister Paggins that was like became the party mascot. I said, "So so my character is fitting Mister Paggins with a noose in the cell." <laughs> Oh, he's, no. he's getting ready he's getting ready to kill himself and mr paggins and greg is like no you said take your you know take your punishment don't do this i said i'm just messing around man and uh interestingly enough uh so dogs in the dungeon is a great supplement it is uh, yes. yeah, and uh, i'm happy to use that in this game i'll post it um if you guys want to have like you know war dogs and warhounds stuff, and stuff. It's a, they it's are a man's supplement. best friend especially in the yeah. dungeon They're They're better than a first level too. fighter yep. right uh cool um <laughs> so we're kind of at a uh you know what well, can we crack the well yeah we're we're 40 minutes in you successfully dispatched these uh be sure to note uh, i think you mentioned you're saving their heads or something <laughs> yeah um and then uh i'll say that those heads weigh like <sighs> for all six of um Two pounds. Um, you know, it's exoskeleton -y, so it's not very heavy. Um, cool. What's okay. next? Um, Aral, who takes a, a minute to put down the lantern, write some notes about this in her journal, sort of sketch the, the room very briefly, occasionally bending down to turn the lantern in order to illuminate things and put that in, in the journal notes. Krenzler up above is just sort of moaning and sobbing uh, and going, oh, I think I just shit myself again. Um, I love it. <laughs> um, and, and of course the, the laborers are just sort of slowly backing away from him while trying to stay in hidden in the tree line. Uh, and then Arel who says, well, do we want to try and, and crack open some of these old sarcophagi or not? Krenzler's incapacitated. He can't look for traps or anything on them. Now, anyone has the ability to search for traps, he's just probably the best at it. Right. With his whopping 19%. Mm -hmm. So, let's look at the, um... Let's look at the sarcophagus. Okay, there's four of them, right? Yeah, I yeah. want to see, like, are they yeah. sealed with wax? Are they sealed with mortar? Are they... Does it look like they've been disturbed? Is there any markings on them, on the sarcophaguses? But writing? So as you take a closer inspection of the sarcophagi in the lantern light, um, you see that they're very ancient, um, and the, the stone itself is very weathered. They're each human size, um, but upon closer inspection, you see that um, though they're eroded and, and a little uh, hard to discern, it is still, um, you can kind of clearly make out like a, a man a woman and then two children a boy and a girl were the shapes that they were originally carved into despite the the details of their features being kind of eroded by time um, the stone itself is that same kind of dark basaltic um, you know minerally greasy almost stone um, and as you inspect the lids themselves um, they appear to be just simply set atop the sarcophagus itself, um, not sealed in any way. And you can even see um, a small crack, um, not like the stone is cracked, but like where 
Um, there's a seam where the, the lid is sitting on each sarcophagus. But it's not, it hasn't been sealed with any wax or anything like that. It's Make sure it's, I'm just seeing if it's airtight, I guess. No, it is not airtight, actually. It appears to not be airtight. And is there, there's no writing or symbols or numbers or anything like that? If there were, it's been faded by Long time. Long eroded. Okay. Uh, RL who goes upstairs, bad boy open. she digs through Krenzler's pack, and then she comes back downstairs with his crowbar, and then hands it over to uh, Wildu. Wildu is interrupted in his prayers, and he, he's like, uh, 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 and he loses his place, and he hands it to Artug. Um, and then uh, Wildu, like, stops what he's doing and, and, like, knows that he has to get the... Uh, the words right so then he like stops and he goes back and he gets out his, his book and he like goes through it until he can make sure he was in the right place he still thinks he's saving the life of Krinsler. uh Artug yeah. uh he takes the crowbar and he's just still chanting and praying and he goes over to the the lid and starts poking around on it see if it reminder on uh St. Yig's dogma um St. Yig demands his followers destroy undead as he views them as an abomination of the highest order. Oh, I did not know that. I've got a wiki up. Uh, let's see. Well, you might be interested in seeing if there's a little bad boy in there for you to take out. Yeah. Do I hear anything? Aha. Uh -huh. Um... Let's find out. Um, we'll say all this to do takes about maybe one turn. So we've been here about 50 minutes. Um, man, I'm so bad at names. Uh, we'll do leans and puts his ear to the lid of the sarcophagus. Um, but he hears only silence within. Okay. He's going to crack it open. Uh, yeah, Arul who says it's well known that the undead make no noise. Did we listen to the one, the father, the mother, the daughter, or the son? Uh, I think your he, choice. He would just listen to the closest one. Um, we'll say, well, so uh, you're uh, imagine you're standing before them, and the father is to your far left, then mother then uh, son, then daughter on your far right. Okay, it would go to the uh, son. Okay, so the far right. Um, so he takes his crowbar. Um, now here's what's funny. So I'm actually going to... Um, I need to make a phone call here real quick. So we're going to do a little mid-session break here. We have, I think, about an hour left planned. So we'll take like, I don't know, 10, 15 or something. Okay. Um, I could be mean and be like, you open it and then we take our break. But <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it's I a little, will. It's a little I, too cinematic for me here. TV. Nice. Delight. Um, it's not difficulty, though it does. He has to slowly do it. Um, and within, and then we'll take our little break here. So let's <laughs> do, let's take... Um, it'd be like 10, 15. Um, and then I think our plan is to play till 1130. Um, is that work for everybody? Um, Good for me. Yep. Okay. Um, I'd be, I could go to like midnight and get maybe 30 more minutes if you guys are interested, but it's cool. We can stop at 1130 too. Uh, we'll what do see you how think? it goes. Cool. Herschel. Um, right. um, uh, uh, last thing for Ross, the um, the bug man that you, uh, the yeah, cleric, Waldo. yeah, Waldo. Waldo. So Waldo sees within this sarcophagus. Where's Waldo? Um, <laughs> I love that. Um, a you know beyond shriveled, um, desiccated, and skeletal corpse um, of a um, young boy, um, and clutched. Um, in his hands, like this, on his chest, is a, a steel dagger with a um, what appears to be handle made of bone. 
Mm. Like, uh, Curious. not like a bone, but a you know, bone. A steel dagger. So we'll pick up that cursed dagger. Hmm. So jealous of that hat, too. Where do you buy the OSR hat? I need one. I, I sell the patches and I'll just send you one. How about that? I have a whole bag of them. We, I make them. Yes. Uh, I'm running a little low on the Stuart Robinson ones, but I'm sure I, ha I have a ton of these Conan ones. That's even better. Yeah, just send me your address. I'll send you as many as you like, or I'll bring them down to Berea next time I'm down there. Love it. I mean, with an iron on. Our tag would probably just take the dagger. Cool. So, uh, does Waldo say, "Hey, I see this"? No, no, it was our tag that was that was like. Oh, yeah. oh, he was opening. It? Okay. Yeah. So he just reaches down and grabs it yeah. without a word. Okay. Um, nothing appears to happen. Nothing appears to happen. As so you was, might expect of any cursed hurt. item. Right to hear that. Uh, yeah, and then he goes to the next one and tries to open it. Cool. Um, so the next one over would be essentially the daughter. And same protocol, you... It open. Everyone else is kind of on guard while uh, uh, your cleric does this. Um, muttering prayers to St. Yig the whole time. So within this one, is a uh, young girl corpse desiccated in the same way um, in kind of laying next to her head within the sarcophagus is a comb made of ivory um, and her hands are laid across her chest like this um, and on her finger is a silver ring All right, I comb my hair. Um, the Hobbit combs his hair with the with the comb. And said this thing is sweet. Reaches in, grabs it. Yeah, he's like teasing his mutton chops. Is there any indication that that these sarcophagi are uh, from something unholy, alien, or also of the um, of the of the Ang Anganok? Oh, so it's it does appear to be of the Anganok or the ancient ones. Um, it seems to be of the the people who dwelled in these lands before what are to you modern times. Oh, uh, Artog would just probably take the the ring then, heedless of the of these of these. Heathens lost souls and corrupted bodies and unhallowed grounds. They're certainly um, not worshippers of Saint Yig, that's for sure. Um, and what he's referring to, uh, just as a brief little lore thing here, so there's two sets of gods in this like campaign, the Anganok and the Futurus. Um, the Anganok are the the gods of like the folk indigenous to this area. Um, from you know, like times before and, and there's still some worship of them. They're gods like Krom or Hearn the Hunter. Um, and then the new gods are gods like Saint Yig, the, the gods of the more like, you know, European fantasy type people um, that have that settled this land, that, that are the reason it's called the Duchy of Eric, you know, Eric Irongard and, and his people. Um, so that's what he's referring to. And these are the ancient people, the indigenous people to this land. Cool. And I uh, keep going. I check. Uh, I check the others. So the next in order would be, um, what is the mother? Um, <laughs> opens it, and this one's a little more simple. Um, you know, it's an adult woman, corpse desiccated in much the same way, hands on her chest, and in this case, there's a gold ring. 
Cool. Uh, we take the uh, gold ring. Cool. I suppose we're tomb robbers now, says Arelhu. Well, I mean, is it? These people are heathens. I mean, they're clearly rich. Let's let's tithe to the church. Yeah, we'll do. He's he says, yes. This is this ground is unhallowed and unholy. We should we should free this and then bring it into the into the blessed sacraments of Saint Yig. Into the light. Yes. Huzzah. <laughs> then do you go on to the final one? Uh, yeah. So within there is an adult male, desiccated corpse, hands clasped on his chest in the same way. He has a gold ring. He also has a silver necklace, um, which has a kind of light blue jewel, uh, maybe that big. Yeah, I never trust men that wear a lot of jewelry. It's very Italian. This may be the body of an Italian. Yeah. Wow. It's like gre greasy hair. <laughs> yeah. No, that's Hard incredible. Tell. Pretty uh, ancient, but um, Arel who like I'm Italian, you know, so I'm holds a little up, bit of fun. Uh, Arel who holds up the the lantern a bit to reflect the light off of the jewel, but she remains firmly ensconced by the base of the stairs because she doesn't want one of these things to suddenly sit up and grab her by the throat. Very true. Very real danger. Um. <laughs> She's, the, the elf says humans do strange things after they die sometimes yeah so, but they're loading the treasure we'll say that um, this is finishing off the first hour here of uh, this is the second well no this is the first day as we said you came with them prepared um, so your first day first hour now um, I rolled for a random encounter, and you're going to get one. So let me decide. Likes, likes. And we're going to probably wrap up slightly early on the cliffhanger or play it out, depending on what we wind up with here. You, I mean, you really shouldn't give me ideas like that. So <laughs> I, I did legitimately roll zombies for you. So, Fantastic. Um, nice. So in fact, these four bodies um, will animate. Now, um, let's see if y'all are surprised by it or you notice it. <sighs> Are elves more difficult to surprise? I think so. I think they are an advanced labyrinth lord. Let me see real quick. They're better at hearing do, do, noises. Do, 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 do. That's true. Uh, no, they just have a thief skill adjustment, I think. Well, they, like they, they are them. naturally better at hearing noises, but yeah, we'll look at the surprise rules and see. Yeah, the, the organization on this book is not the best. Not the best, so. no, no. <laughs> That's uh, like one of, one of my main criticisms, is it? But once you learn the strange logic, you... Okay, I did a search out. for all instances of surprise in the document and didn't find anything about elves having a bonus there. Oh, that works for me. So they're better at hearing. Just nothing to do with surprise. Um, okay, so we'll roll. And then if uh, your leader would roll a d6 for your side. Sure. Five. Okay. <laughs> so no one's surprised. Um, so that's going to mean that you... Uh, are aware of each other. Um, so let's roll for initiative. We got a five over here. Did you already roll? Oh, sorry. Five. Five as well. I, okay. So everyone goes at the same time. 
Love Ooh, it. So simultaneously. Simultaneously, the, uh, you notice the, um, these four bodies starting to rouse. Uh, and we'll kind of theater of the mind this too. Huh. Um, kind of down the road will be more in depth and like tile by tile and stuff. But first night, kind of take it easy. So the way that it flows is I think it's movement first. Uh, is anybody trying to move? Uh, yeah, Zazabone's getting in the corner because he's not much use with his staff and dagger. So Zazabone backs up. You can even leave the the mound itself if you'd like. No, I'm not going to run on the boys, but... Good. Love that. Backs up. Um, what about... Anyone else moving? Um, whoops. Uh, Artug is not going to move. He's going to actually bring his shield up and mace and try to turn the undead and fight. Aha. Uh -huh. Um, and so any missile attacks? Yes, I'm going to try to point blank shot him with my, with, uh, August's bow. Okay. So it'll be plus two at or is it, is it, do you get additional plus one at point blank range? Or is it just plus one at short range? It's the plus one at short okay. range, I believe. Um, yeah. You gotta be at least five feet apart, but that's easy to manage. Eleven. Uh, Eleven to hit? Okay. AC eight. Zombies, I think, are eight. I'll double check it, but I think you're right. Yep. Five points of damage. Okay. I'll very quickly roll up some HP here. So five? Yes. Okay. I'm really enjoying this dungeon synth. I just put on one of the I think I posted the link, but I just turned the mute. I turned it down really low, which is kind of like background. That's what I do, yeah. Quite like enjoyable. Perfect. Um, Ancient boreal forest. So, um, your halfling, you know, connects, does the damage. Um, which one was he aiming at? The one closest to him, so we'll just say the. Uh, I, I could just roll d4. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't have a strong feeling about. I'll arbitrarily say it's the young boy. Sure. Um, the the arrow clips him um, through the shoulder, and that arm is left behind as he rises, um, but he does continue to rise. Hmm. Um, any other missile attacks? Spells. Spells are next. Any spells? Uh, Arel, who uh, hadn't called it, uh, casts her magic missile spell at the little girl zombie. Okay. And that will automatically hit, and it does d6 plus 1. I don't know why it rolled a d8 there when I told it to roll a d6. Let's try this again. All right, seven points of damage. And you said the little girl? Yep. So that is enough to destroy her, um, if you'd like to describe it in some suitable, so, spectacular way. Arelho has put the lantern down over in the, the corner of the room next to the stairs so that it, it's illuminating everything but leaves her hands free. And once they start to rise, as she predicted, she makes a, a quick arcane gesture and speaks a few twisted words. And then this sort of cerulean bolt of energy rips out from her hands and straight into the, the little girl zombie blowing open its chest cavity and sending a little shower of gore spurting out of it as the, the body is knocked over like a doll back into the sarcophagus. Don't piss off the elf. All right, no, uh, blast it apart. Um, now it's melee. Wait, I got Who two spells. 
Oh, you got spells? All right, spells out. Uh, um, they're both gonna try to. Undead, right? Yeah, they're both gonna try to do it. So we're gonna. So I've got the the table for Barrow Maze up here. So you go ahead and roll your uh, dice, and I'll let you know. I got a nine and an eight. So, those are actually both six. Well, eh. these guys have two hit dice. Um, uh, you're just shy. So nice. both of those are successful. Uh, so you invoke Saint Yig, and you feel um, kind of that brief glimpse of the light right within, um, but it quickly fades and. Uh, these uh, foul undead seem unaffected. Uh -huh. um, and then now it's melee. Who all is meleeing? Anybody? Yeah, Zazamon's using his staff with two hands. Go for it. No. I'm a wizard, mind you. Then I'll roll my attacks. Well, who, uh, Zazabone's in melee range. Well, uh, he's a, he's a one step. They probably don't have reach. So that's why I was using my staff to try to kind of give me some standoff range. Back. So they won't, they'll, they won't be able to attack till next turn once they've moved. Cause I don't think anyone is actually in melee range. Um, I mean, we're kind of theater of the minding it, but. So, let's roll initiative for the next uh, right, right. round here. This could be all over for us, boys. Two. I got a four. So, they're going first. Um, so, for you, for them, they rapid, you know, or as, not rapidly, Lord. Um, they ravenously um, <laughs> come forth from their sarcophaguses. Um, uh, and, isn't it, and isn't it, it, sorry, isn't it three of them? I blew apart the... The young yeah, girl three. corpse. So okay. um, everyone but arm. the elf has someone on them. Um, and that's what they do during the movement phase, unless you all try to run away from them. Your decision. I say we make a run for it and we can fight them one at a time as they come up and out. If uh, Is the passage in a single... How wide is the passage? Like uh, 10 feet. Oh, so it's double. Okay, well... That still might be preferable. I say we run for the and hold him at the hold him at the door, boys, or hold him at the stairs. We can say it's five. We'll say it's five. Okay. Yeah. yeah I think they. I think they are five. The the two clerics could try to hold the door. So you could try to move and do a choke point. Uh -huh. Oh door. Cool. <laughs> so you guys. So as they're Our moving is, towards is you, absolutely ho door. Like that is basically religious ho door. So, uh, how do you guys position yourselves with the the choke point set up here? As they're moving forth, you guys are piling out. But how do you stack up? Uh, Arl, who's going to grab her lantern and move up the staircase. Um, she has a full forty foot movement speed, so she can get to the top of the stairs and still illuminate the the chamber below with the lantern from the back. Yeah, the stairs only, or maybe a five foot rise. So absolutely. Okay. So yeah, she's gonna back up and then provide light from the the rear. Does uh, the halfling go like out and then keep going and plans to shoot at the doorway? Yeah, what I want to do is he's gonna go out and and he uh, you know, he's pretty quick. He's only in leather armor too. I'm gonna try to position myself so that that uh, if there's stairs up, I should be able to hypothetically stand on the side of the mound and shoot down into the. Like straight, straight down between right past my foot, right, and I would be shooting down into the as they come out into the sun. If if it definitely, if they, if uh, I can do that, I don't know if how, how it's configured. But. Yeah, that works. And then, uh, what about so uh, our half orc thief is literally like by the trees with or, or you know back hiding behind a, a, the bole of a tree, right, with the the diggers like throwing up, <laughs> uh, and then. What about the clerics? How do they position themselves? I would imagine they form a shield wall at the bottom uh, with their holy symbols and try to scare some of them off if possible and then form the defensive wall. 
So did they position at the bottom of the stairs or at the top? The bottom. Okay, so they have to get past them to even get shot. Past the clerics to even get shot at, right? Yeah. Past the... You mean... Or do you want to come out up the stairs? You mean people can't shoot past us? You're saying if the clerics are at the bottom of the stairs? They need to come up one step. Oh, well, Probably yeah, we do that. Yeah. Yeah, I, okay, cool. So in that case, that's, I'm cool with that. Otherwise, I'd probably give them, like, cover, basically. Um, groovy. So that's movement. So uh, next up is missile attacks. I think uh, just the bow, right? Yep. So you're up against AC-8? No, no good. Five. Um, cool. And are you keeping track of how many arrows you're shooting? I think it's yeah. good to see Groovy. Um... So unfortunately, the arrow um, arcs over the heads of the clerics and then sails off into the um, depths of the, the barrow here. Um, next up will be spells, if there's any left. Not for me. Uh, now, why then, do we get a second level spell? I can't cast that for till next level, right? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, okay. you get this. You get to yeah. start with it in your spell book, but it's kind of like you get to look forward to it. Basically, yeah. <laughs> web, web, web's a good spell, but I didn't think I'd be able to cast it. Um, so melee is going to be between the zombies themselves and these clerics, right? Wait, I, I'm. Uh, okay, yeah, sure, that worked. I'll do melee. Uh, well, I don't. They probably couldn't catch up to you guys this turn. Um, you're all right on that, but if you stay in your position, they will be on you the next turn. Uh, so let me, so this will be the third round, or I say turn round, um, initiative. I got a two. Oh. No, no pressure. Tw oh, well, wrong, uh, wrong game. We're not playing sixth edition. <laughs> I got a two as well. Okay. So it'll be simultaneous again. Um, I think the only ones moving are the zombies, is that correct? Yep. So they, so these, um, we said it's five foot, so, um, so we'll, we'll keep with that, and then, so which cleric is in front of which cleric? Oh, if it's just, uh, if it's just like enough space for, for one of yeah, them. We'll, we'll say it's one square, so it's yeah. five feet. Then it would be Arteg would be in the front. Okay. Um, and so, um, essentially, three zombies will be able to hit him, um, or try to, right? Um, so, I'll roll those real quick. We have a seven. Twelve. And a 10. I don't know if any of those hit. I don't think they do. Because you probably... What's your AC? I have a uh, armor class uh, 3. Ooh. I don't think any of those hit. All right. Fancy. Fancy. So, um, the, the father... Because who did you blow up? The daughter. Yeah. So, the father, the one-armed son, and the mother crowd into the clerics. These foul, uh, undead... Uh, their corpses a dry stench um, and you know uh, me getting worse by the moment in the humidity of the barrel mounds they're pressing in they're close their teeth are snapping at you they're trying to get past your shields and your armor to no avail um, roll your attack oh uh, for the melee attack yeah roll your two hit mm -hmm. And Zazabone uh, attack over their heads with his staff? Uh, I'll say no on that one. Okay. Uh, uh, I rolled yeah, a... Yeah, definitely hit. Let's see. You rolled 19. It's hard to get the chart. 19 does armor class 0. Yeah, you crush. Uh, they're AC 8. Um, go ahead and roll your damage. All right. Uh, and uh, which one were you swinging at? Oh. The one-armed son? 
Um, the father or the mother? The one arm son. Yeah, that makes, makes sense. Cool. Uh, I'm definitely going to put this on paper next time. Let's see. Ooh, uh, five damage, right? Yeah, nice. and then... Oops, not will do. Artug. I'm definitely going to put these on paper next time. Uh, Artug... Yeah, it's just five. Yeah. So that is enough to vanquish the sun, if you'd like to describe it for us. Um... He uh, he's wobbling up there with his like, uh, without a without an arm, and uh, Artug just takes the arm, and uh, like brings the mace up underneath the the remaining arm, and and cracks off like the the arm and the the head, the head and arms like go clattering across the floor, still moving. The rest of the body Love just it. slumps to the ground. Love it. Um. So we're moving into the the next round here. Let's hit initiative. We got a five. <laughs> like I, I think I'm done rolling initiative, boys. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we got a. Uh, I don't think anyone's moving. Um, uh, so they're they don't they're obviously not doing missile attacks, but but, but let, let's see their melee attacks here. Might have some hits here. Let me double check. AC3 you said, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the second day of summer, right? Nah, uh, we said that you guys brought the diggers with you on the first day. Oh, my bad. Okay. Um... Ooh, they both hit. Okay. You know, for my own morbid curiosity, uh, well, actually, I'd rather be surprised, so don't tell uh -huh. me how many hit points they have. <laughs> uh, but we got two hits here. And I think they do. Uh, D8. Yeah, they do. Ooh, ouch. Longsword hits. Alright. So, uh, our tag takes four points of damage. Mm -hmm. Alright. Um. And we'll say it was the mother who came in. So, um. These. The remaining two are reaching and snapping. Um, and trying to get past your shield. Um, and with one of the mother's like flailing attempts to get at you, she manages to give you a nice, uh, deep claw wound across the face. Um, you can feel some of your blood start to drizzle down your cheek. Um, that's them. Now it's y'all's turn. Mm. Uh, so movement goes first. I don't think there's any moves. Then missile. I think you're firing the short bow, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Nope. <laughs> Another arrow sails into the darkness. You hear the halfling cursing to himself. I oh, know. <laughs> um, and then uh, we have spells. Um, um, will do. We'll try to turn the undead. Turn the undead. So we'll roll a 2d6 here. I got a uh, 9. Yay, I think. Nope, I think that's. So I'll just tell you, I mean, you can look at the table. I think you need a 10 to turn them. Yeah. You need a 10. So you're just shy again. So again, the same feeling. It almost gives you some existential doubt about your god. But, yeah. Uh, uh, and then melee. So I think Artag's the only um, eligible bachelor on that one. Whoops. Can I keep that though? Here's the, the hit. Ah, I missed anyway, probably. Seven. Can I keep that? Uh, it's verse AC8, but I think that still misses for sure. Uh, uh, Alright, so another round progresses. I think it was the fifth round. 
Um, these are 10 seconds each, right? So it's been about a right. minute of here. Um, initiative over here, I've got Three. six. Okay, they're going first. Wow. Okay. So here we go. Uh, let me roll my to hit. Okay, I know that one hits. Dude, I got two hits again. We might have our first kill. That's uh, Artug that's taking the, the tank, Should've right? Should've cast Cure Light Wounds. Oh, yeah, I could have cast a spell. Oh, yeah, that's a oh, thing. Yeah. Oh, well. uh, I think he's dead because he just took five. Yeah, so Artag, uh, he, uh, he's the whole time he's like getting beat in with these things and, and getting clawed and stabbed and pulled at. And eventually they rip in and pull his, you know, guts and flesh out and everything as the armor is being peeled back. And as he slumps to the ground in the dark, uh, you can still just hear him meekly being like, St. Yig comforts, St. Yig helps, St. Yig with me, you know, like trails off and dies they're like pulling the entrails up <laughs> um, as he's saying that this, stuff and this is like perfect time it's 11 30 on the money does the party cut and run here um do they try to recover the body anything like that oh or do they try to vanquish these other two uh will do would totally run the but only right. problem is one thing and worth keep noting. Keep in mind, too, from like a lore perspective, your characters are probably aware of the undead, but they, this is probably the first time they've seen them, and it's probably, hopefully, the first time they've seen one of their companions torn apart. <laughs> well, this is new. Artug, Artug <laughs> has all the treasure. He has the silver ring, the gold, the two gold rings, and the jeweled necklace. Oh, so, and, and the bone-handed dagger. Well, do you think that Will do can take them? Yeah, if he can, that's what he would try to do. He would try to drag the body out or, you know, get the pack off and run. Well, I think that's, that's probably impossible them. because the zombies are on top of him. Right. Well, they're ripping him apart. They're interested in eating him. So I, I do genuinely, I would say that if you, like, cut the straps and just tried to take the pack, I could see that being possible because they're occupied with eating him right now. Yeah. Yeah, he, he would definitely try to do that. He is lawful neutral. I don't see a need for a check or anything like that. They don't care about his treasure. They care about eating him. While they're, they're preoccupied feasting. eating, could we have the opportunity to try to maybe burn them with lantern oil or I don't know? They're 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 vulnerable, right? I mean, they're sitting there kneeled over him eating. So I give everybody a free attack if they want it, and that could include throwing oil on them or something. Right. All right, that's what uh, August is going to throw oil on him, and Zazabone's going to pitch a torch on him. We'll do fleas with the stuff. <laughs> well, for that, let's do... That sounds like basically just two attack rolls to me. Um, do you shout something to, to Waldo, <laughs> like... Uh, Fire in the hole! Yeah, exactly. You give him a yeah, heads up. Watch out, lads. Love it. Uh, so, Waldo's... Uh, do you have a knife or something? Uh, Waldo does not, no. Actually, maybe that's take, an interesting... Maybe, well, we'll lower it up so, you know, he grabs the dagger that he just oh, took. Oh, yeah, that's true. Probably stuck in his belt or something. Grabs that, cuts the straps, very cinematic, grabs the pack. Woof. And then he hears Hoggis over, over the quarter, you know, you know, watch out, lads. And he looks up, and in his sailing, a... Uh, um, he rolls a three. Oh, oh no! <laughs> oh no! Nails. I'm not that mean. Yeah, save versus uh, spell. So it's, there's there's a whole table in the first edition DMG for grenade-like uh, missile <laughs> scattering. Be nice today. So it uh, <laughs> so it uh, it splatters on like the lintel of the opening, right? And so halfling curses to himself again, um, and I, I'll give the. Uh, magic user, the forethought, okay, it missed, so I'm not throwing the torch. Uh, but you're able to get the pack, and I think that's a perfect little bow on it. Um, get the heck uh, out of here. And here's the thing. Um, yeah, would you say that you guys try to just, like, run away? Um, 
and would your characters try to run away and lose them which like their movement speed is very slow so it's like it's basically impossible for them to catch you um so would you try to lose them and continue exploring or um would you um decide to pack it in and head back we have to get back to helix uh yeah. errol who's shouting as the group is like backing away she, um she shouts to the laborers get him on the pony and points at krenzler who's like still lying yeah. on the ground clutching his guts and says I need, I, and get ready to run the, for it uh, morale check here okay laborers uh 2d6 i get it errol who has a five 13 so charisma eight. so her retainers have a morale of eight um, I get an eight. All right, that makes it. So they they her rousing speech makes them hold on just barely. She can tell they want to run. Um, mm -hmm. But so that means the next session, session two, which the plan is to have it next Friday, um, will take place beginning in Helix as you return. Um, well, I'll have I'll come up with some names for your um, your digging crew. Um, remember we did they're they're getting five gold a month that's their pay right now um they they've already been paid for you know this and we'll, by month we'll say each three ten days is a month right um so there'll be three months in summer um cool that was fun um i always like to ask this a couple little questions at the end um crunch versus fluff is that